everyone. This is the lecture for endocrine function. There are two lectures this week that are being recorded because we're not able to meet in person. Uh, this is normally what would be the in-person lecture, and I'm recording, recording it and delivering it the same way that we do our normal Wednesday online lectures. In the future, we're going to be using Zoom in place of our in-person lectures. So I wanted to start out by saying thank you all for checking in with that announcement, for keeping updated with how things are going and our plan of action. Um, I know that this is a hybrid course, and so a lot of you started out the semester anticipating spending some time online, um, but I know that it's going to be a little bit challenging being fully online, it's definitely a different experience, especially since you're going to be having the lab online too. So because all of you are pre-health and you're obviously taking physiology for an important reason, I want to first assure you that um, the online format of the labs, the way that the course of record is written is that that still fulfills your requirements. So generally, um, when I've talked to the nursing instructors before, they've said that with hybrid courses, if the lecture is in person, or if the lecture is online and the lab is in person, that fulfills nursing school requirements. Um, we've had a good portion of the, of the semester in person for the labs. Um, we know that the labs being online meets our institutional standards, and I am, the information I've been given is that this will still meet kind of nursing school standards because this is such an abnormal situation. So I'm going to keep in contact with two of our nursing instructors as the semester plays out. Um, they are insanely busy right now figuring out their classes because um, RN and LVN classes generally have to be in person. So they're having to deal with all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I'm giving them some time to sort that out and then I'll be in contact with them just to really firmly make sure and you know get their word basically that um, this course will still give you credit and be accepted by nursing schools. So I'm sure that's kind of tangentially a concern for some of you how this will affect your long time future. Um, I know that a lot of you are probably dealing with work changes and really extreme childcare changes. So again, please just keep in contact with me. I'm not expecting you to automatically adjust to this new way of doing things. We'll build in time to um, get used to using Zoom and troubleshoot that and we'll just kind of take it one step at a time. So thank you for your patience and your flexibility. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, I do not have COVID-19, but my asthma is acting up real bad. It hasn't been an issue since I moved out of the valley, but now that I'm back, it's really flaring up. So if my voice does anything funky, that's why um, I do not have the novel coronavirus and there's not a chance that I spread it to you guys. So sorry about that. Um, in terms of what we're kind of focusing on in this lecture, this online lecture is uh, really focusing on general ideas about the endocrine system and endocrine physiology. Um, so we'll be thinking about different types of signaling, including endocrine, but also contrasting that with autocrine and paracrine. That's more about definitions and just distinguishing between those. We'll look at distinctions between the endocrine and the nervous system. So those are both involved in really important signaling within your body. We'll talk about nervous system in the next learning unit, the kind of um, next exam material. Uh, so we'll distinguish between those. We'll also think about chemical properties of the hormone. So by chemical properties, what I'm talking about there is whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic. That's really the basis of it. Understanding, uh, thinking back to those biological molecules, thinking about lipids and proteins are really going to help you make that distinction between hydrophobic and hydrophilic. You should also ground that in your knowledge of the cell. So the fact that the um, extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid, the cytoplasm, are water-based, they're hydrophilic in nature, and that the plasma mem membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, so it's naturally hydrophobic, and that like dissolves like, that things, you know, like stick together um, if they are similar um, in chemistry. So uh, this idea that hydrophilic things are going to get along with hydrophilic things and hydrophobic things are going to get along with hydrophobic things. 
That's what I mean by chemical properties. We'll think about these second messengers, cyclic AMP and the DAG IP3 pathway. So for those, you should um, generally understand their importance for hydrophilic hormones. Um, kind of think about these chain reactions. I will not ask you specifics about the enzymes that are involved in those pathways because we don't have a ton of time to unpack this and integrate it prior to the exam. We'll think about what we mean by up and down regulation and these ideas of permissive, synergistic, and antagonistic hormone interactions. So again, just kind of like visualizing how this is happening and thinking about definitions, and then think about three specific mechanisms that can act to stimulate the release of hormones or not release of hormones from endocrine glands. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time reviewing material you should have learned in Bio 5 just to make sure you have a basis for these kinds of interactions. So when we're thinking about these signaling molecules, kind of broadly, we call those ligands or ligands. Um, so you might have heard of like a ligand gated channel. Um, those open up when they bind to something. Here we're thinking about ligands or, chemi or chemical signaling molecules binding to receptors. So these are smaller molecules. Generally, they have a very important structure function relationship with the receptors on their target cells. And by that, I mean that just like how enzymes and substrates fit together like puzzle pieces, these chemical signaling molecules, these ligands and their receptors bind together with high specificity. They fit together like puzzle pieces. So you have to have both the signal and the receptor in order for there to be a cellular effect. So in this image, you can see that there's an intracellular receptor, and that's right here. So I just want to point that out. The reason they're distinguishing that is because there are also extracellular receptors. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. When a chemical signaling molecule binds to the receptor, we call that signal perception. So the cell is perceiving that signal, it's receiving information about the world around it. So I wanted to take a moment and think about this idea of intracellular signal transduction. So that's a fancy way of saying that the signal gets passed on multiple times. And I really want to emphasize that idea of it being a multi-step process these chemical signaling molecules basically flip a switch that maybe flips another switch and flips another switch. Some of them kind of more directly interact with DNA, for example, but for the most part, we have a series of reactions taking place here. So we're going to simplify it a lot of the time, but please keep in mind that depending on the type of cell, depending on the type of signal and receptor and the enzymes found within the cell, that cellular response that ultimately happens can be any manner of things. So there's a lot of different possibilities. We are really simplifying these pathways so that you have a firm grounding in kind of that overall cell biology. So I mentioned that in order for there to be a response, you have to have both the signal and the receptor on that specific target cell. So um, in this example right here, it distinguishes between a target cell, the cell that is supposed to be receiving the signal that has that receptor, and a non-target cell. There's no receptor for the ligand or ligand. So that is kind of like a clean, neat way of distinguishing between types of cells relative to the signaling molecule. But keep in mind that sometimes target cells don't have receptors that they are supposed to have. So for example, in the next online lecture for this week, I am talk about something called androgen insensitivity syndrome um, and this idea of intersex conditions. So oftentimes people get on the internet and they're like, oh, according to biology, there's only XX and XY, there's only female and male. And by biological standards, that is absolutely false. Um, so even just by chromosomes, there can be XX, XY, XYY, XXY, which is called Klinefelter syndrome. There can be X naught or X null, where there's only one X chromosome and no other sex chromosome. That's called Turner syndrome. There's XXYY, XXXY, so all kinds of different chromosomal conditions. 
even if you are XY, sometimes on the Y chromosome, your SRY gene, which kind of switches on the development of what's considered the male reproductive system, is missing or doesn't get activated. So you could be chromosomally male, but um, in terms of your gonads and reproductive anatomy, you could be female. Um, and then there's also something called, again, androgen insensit insensitivity syndrome. This is um, oftentimes these individuals are XY, sometimes they're XX, but basically they produce androgens, these testosterone type hormones that are associated with male biology, um, but you don't have the receptors for that. So you can produce as much of that hormone as you want. Um, you can produce the maybe what's considered the appropriate or normal range for a given physiological state, but if you don't have the receptors, you're not receiving any of that information. It's not having any effect on the cell. So these individuals are oftentimes XY in terms of their chromosome, but um, their kind of external or even internal anatomy tends to be part of that female reproductive system. So we'll talk about that in the other online lecture where I talk about specific hormones, but sometimes we just don't have the receptors that you know, we would expect to have. And so the target cell doesn't end up having a cellular response. So when we're thinking about that ligand, um, I'm saying that all kinds of different pronunciations. I usually say ligand. I think a lot of people say ligand, which is why I was trying to get myself to say ligand. When the signal is sent, um, sometimes that signal is hydrophobic. It plays really nicely with the plasma membrane, but it does not do so well um, when it's kind of like in fluid. So with these signaling molecules, they can really easily pass through the plasma membrane. They get through it no problem. In eukaryotic cells like ours, they pass through the nuclear envelope no problem, and they can get directly to the DNA. So they might bind to receptors that are actually inside of the cell or embedded um, in the internal like area of the plasma membrane. Um, they can pass through that kind of phospholipid bilayer. With hydrophilic signals, however, those have to kind of bind externally and switch on something from outside the cell. So they involve these things called second messengers. We'll talk about cyclic AMP as well as the DAG IP3 pathway in a bit. So when we're thinking about the response that actually happens when a um, cell receives information from a signal, there is kind of a few different ways we can categorize those responses. Um, I'm sharing this here just so you kind of generally understand what we mean by a cellular response. We'll talk about kind of these phosphorylation cascades that happen. If you get bogged down in those details, it's easy to forget what the point of this is. So I just want you to remember that when a signal binds to receptor, that might result in changes in gene expression. It can maybe make more or less of a particular protein. Um, it can result in metabolism or division and growth. So some of those cell, um, some of those signals maybe encourage uh, the cell to tap into glycogen reserves and break them apart and access that glucose for cellular respiration. Um, we talked about those different uh, metabolic states. So that kind of is associated with accessing that glycogen, or conversely, if you have plenty of glucose in your, that absorptive state, um, a hormone might send a signal to pack that glucose into glycogen to save it for later. Uh, there's also growth factors, which are what we call positive regulators. Those move the cell cycle forward. Uh, for example, growth hormone encourages cell division of like muscle, for example. So sometimes people will abuse it and then they're bones and their like hands and facial features also uh, kind of grow um, in addition to their muscle. So that's why Sylvester Stallone kind of has those exaggerated facial features and hands because he took growth hormone to build up his muscles. Sorry, my dog is snoring. Um, and then it can also result in apoptosis or cell death. Um, this is associated with negative regulators, which encourage apoptosis. Remember that Programmed cell death is 
so important. It's important to make sure that we don't have cancerous cells in our body. Um, a lot of cancer is associated with problems with those negative regulators that encourage apoptosis. Um, if you have a mutation, you don't want that cell to divide and pass on that mutation. And if the mutation can't be fixed, then the cell goes through programmed cell death to make sure that it doesn't end up reproducing and creating more cells that don't have the right DNA sequence. Also, if you think about tissue developing, we all start out as a ball of cells, but clearly we have very elegant body plans. If you look at your hands or feet, there are clearly gaps between um, different digits. So what this image is showing is a histological slide of a um, the foot of a mouse embryo. Um, so you can see those little toes starting to emerge, and sometimes people or dogs have webbing in between their fingers and their toes. Um, that webbing happens because apoptosis didn't happen to kind of remove the tissue that exists between those different digits. So forming tissue um, in the kind of uh, expected body plan, um, making sure that we have separation between different parts of our body fundamentally comes down to apoptosis in development. And that apoptosis is often regulated by hormones. So when we're thinking about how a cell might respond to different signals um, or kind of uh, how the signals are being sent, what cells they are coming from, we can kind of distinguish chemical signaling broadly into three different categories based on how far the signal travels. So autoprin, auto means self, like an autobiography, this is signaling within a single cell. So that crin part is just telling you there's a signal and a receptor, there's something happening there. So just focus on the first part of that word, auto is self, this is signaling within a single cell. So the cell produces a signal, it acts on itself, and then that keeps that cycle going. For paracrine, para means close to or next to or at the same time. So paracrine signaling is signaling between cells that are close to one another. So the signaling cell is very close to the target cell physically. Um, there's like physical proximity. So that's paracrine signaling. But when we're thinking about the kind of chemical signaling that takes place in the endocrine system, endocrine signaling is signaling across long distances. So for example, the signaling cell releases the hormone, it travels in the bloodstream, and then very far away, the, there's an effect on the target cell. So for example, in the next lecture, and especially um, in the last learning unit when we talk about reproduction, a lot of signals, a lot of hormones are sent from the brain all the way to the gonadal tissue. So that is quite a long distance to travel within your body. There is a signaling cell, like for example, the pituitary, that is releasing a signal that is traveling through the bloodstream and having an effect on a target cell way on the opposite side of the body. So that's what we mean by endocrine signaling. Um, so endocrine is happening within your body. Um, so we, you know, a lot of the time we think about everything in our body happening within our body. But remember, for example, your digestive system is not actually inside of your body. I mean, it, it appears to be, but the stuff that's inside of your digestive system is technically outside of you because there's this hollow tube that runs throughout your body. So when we have um, stuff being moved uh, through the exocrine system, we're coming out of exocrine glands, it's being secreted into ducts, which take it outside of your body, either kind of directly secreted outside or into your digestive system, which is technically outside your body. With endocrine, this is basically just leaked directly from the gland into your body, doesn't go through a duct, um, just goes directly into your bloodstream and has an effect somewhere else. So we've also talked a lot about homeostasis, this idea of maintaining a steady internal state using feedback loops. Um, so when we're thinking about this part over here, where we have a signal being sent from the control center to the effector, part of that might be neurological. Another big part of it might be endocrine. So we have these um, this output information, this signal being sent to an effector, 
So that effector itself might be an endocrine gland, or it could be um, something that's being acted on by a hormone. So this idea of the endocrine system is really important for maintaining homeostasis. Again, today um, in this lecture, we're just specifically talking about the system broadly, different types of signaling and signaling molecules for the actual system, like what glands comprise the system and what hormones are produced. That's the next lecture. Remember also that um, these positive feedback loops, when we say that, it means that we're going out of homeostasis. There is a definite endpoint. Um, so for example, in birth, you have the head of the baby pushing against the cervix. That sends a signal that causes oxytocin to be secreted, which is carried in the bloodstream back to the uterus. So here we have an example of a hormone moving through the bloodstream. That is not great handwriting. And then also the bloodstream. So that oxytocin is the hormone. Um, the bloodstream is traveling or carrying that signal to back to the um, uterus that is causing more contractions, which pushes the baby against the cervix again and keeps that cycle going. So that um, effect, the effect of having that um, contraction results in even more stimulus. Um, so then also negative uh, feedback loops keep us in homeostasis. We'll think about how we do that with hormones. Sometimes we have to kind of like have a way of breaking down the hormone or the second messenger to stop the signal from going on too far. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. When we're thinking about the endocrine system, this is this uh, image on the right side of your screen is going to be really important for the next lecture. I basically kind of have this framing every single section. We'll talk about the um, uh, the pineal gland, the thalamus, and the pituitary gland, this hypothalamus axis in the brain. We'll think about the thyroid um, and the parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands, which kind of sit on top of the kidney. Remember that renal means kidney, so adrenal is on top of the kidney. The pancreas, which has both endocrine and exocrine function. Uh, the uterus um, and ovaries. So in terms of the uterus, we'll kind of think about placental hormones. And then the ovaries and testes, those are gonadal tissue that also have their own hormones. So these, uh, those are the different glands within the endocrine system. The hormones, um, what we mean by that are these chemical signaling molecules that are secreted by those glands in the endocrine system. Those secretions, those hormones travel through the bloodstream, affects the target cell somewhere else in the body. That can be very, very fast, or it can be a little bit slower of a response. And depending on where the signal is being received, depending on the different proteins and the pathway involved, there can be a lot of different effects, even with the same hormone. And it's very carefully regulated by feedback loops. So I mentioned that there's kind of a distinction between the endocrine system signaling and the nervous system signaling. Um, endocrine system, we are talking specifically about chemical signaling. These are chemicals that are binding to a receptor and having an effect. With the nervous system, it's a little bit more elegant. There's electrochemical signaling. So it does involve some chemicals. We have those vesicles with different neurotransmitters that release them across the synapse. We'll unpack that a lot in the next unit. Um, and then we also have those different ions. So uh, I think in the first lab worksheet, I put in a review question there about why action potentials and the nervous system are associated with electrochemical signaling. Remember in that lab, we talked about ions. So we have especially sodium ion and potassium ion in terms of propagating that action potential and changing the membrane polarity. We also have calcium ions, which are involved in releasing those neurotransmitters. So we have this big idea of electrochemical, electrical and chemical signaling in the nervous system. The endocrine system tends to be a little bit slower of a response and it's reacting to changes in the internal environment. So when you have a physical change inside of your body, oftentimes the endocrine system has a kind of slower response to that gradual change. 
The nervous system is all about perceiving the external environment and having a quick response. So if you see someone swerving in front of you in traffic, what are you going to do? That's your nervous system. You might over time, like as you're recovering from that, feel the effects of your endocrine system functioning. Um, so the endocrine system might kind of slowly lag behind and help with that nervous system response. But oftentimes it's kind of like gradual changes that happen based on fluctuations in your physiology over time. The endocrine system also is a lot less specific than the nervous system. The nervous system really finally depends on interactions uh, between different cells, those synapses. Um, the endocrine system basically releases this hormone, travels through your bloodstream, any cell it comes into contact with, with that receptor, there's going to be binding and a cell response. So sometimes we mess around with hormones to control one part of our body, but it has lots of other effects. So for example, if you take exogenous hormones for birth control, like the pill or the Depo-Provera shot um, or the subdermal implant, those are all adding hormones and changing that chemical signaling in order to help regulate your cycle and also prevent conception and f fertilization. Um, but there's also a lot of effects that happen and um, gets into this whole issue of acceptable risk um, and clinical bias. But for example, things like um, random inability to walk, um, basic things like um, like having excess hair growth and acne changes and weight fluctuations, things like libido changes, as well as really serious issues like blood clots. Um, all of those are associated with those uh, taking those hormone medications for birth control. Um, so when we have those hormones coming in and we're changing them, we're not just changing the target, we're changing lots of other things that are affected by those hormones. So I already kind of mentioned this, um, when we have endocrine glands, these are ductless glands. They are just releasing those hormones directly into surrounding fluid. Some of those get into the um, bloodstream and travel around. Um, so when we say ductless, we mean that these glands do not have these ducts right here, like the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct, that's exocrine. So if, some, if you have something like a tear duct or the hepatic duct or different things like that, that duct is taking that secretion specifically to a location out of the body. Um, if it's endocrine, it doesn't have that. It's like the thyroid or the parathyroid where they're just secreting these hormones and they're going kind of broadly into the surrounding fluid. So some examples of this that we already talked about are the pituitary, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenal gland, the pineal gland, the pancreas, and gonadal tissue like the ovaries and testes. So when we're thinking about kind of categorizing hormones by their chemical structure, we broadly distinguish them as steroid, amine, peptide, and protein. And when you hear amine, peptide, and protein, those probably all kind of sound similar to you in terms of having to do with proteins. So here you can start to see amine, peptide, and protein probably have some chemical similarities. Steroid should make you think about lipids. So I'm gonna walk our way through each of these individually, starting with steroids, which are lipid-derived hormones. And the image on the right is the chemical structure of estrogen. That is a type of steroid hormone. It's lipid-derived. Um, so these are derived specifically from cholesterol. Remember that cholesterol uh, fits into the category of lipids. Oftentimes when we're talking about fats, we're thinking about those triglycerides. Um, so kind of like these fatty acid and glycerol arrangements. Um, but broadly, lipids are things that are hydrophobic. So that includes cholesterol, which is a big part of the cell membrane, um, and these cholesterol derivatives have these ring structures that are characteristics, uh, characteristic of steroids, of cholesterol, of these types of lipids. So these include the major sex hormones. Um, estrogen is just kind of like a broad category of what are considered female sex hormone. Um, androgen is a broad category of male sex hormones. Um, estrogen 
Diol is one of the kind of classical examples of an estrogen. Testosterone is probably the best known example of an androgen. And then also cortisol, which you might know is involved in stress response. So these are hydrophobic. They're lipid derived, they're fatty, they are not interacting well with water. They're insoluble in water, kind of like a lava lamp. So they're afraid of water. That means that when they're traveling in the blood, they have to be bound to a transport protein. They have to have, basically have a chaperone that takes them through the blood. Um, when they meet the cell, they are able to pass through the plasma membrane and bind to receptors in the cell. So we'll go back to that in just a moment. When we're thinking about amine hormones, these are individual amino acids that have modified groups. So remember, amino acids are that monomer of proteins, and each one of those has a central carbon, um, an uh, H right here, so this hydrogen right here, which we don't often draw when we're drawing the skeletal structures. I'll show you that in just a moment. They're called amino acids because they have this amino group and this carboxylic acid over here, COOH. And then there's a unique R group up here, which is different for every amino acid. So this is the chemical structure of tyrosine. Again, when we draw the skeletal structure, we don't usually draw the hydrogen, but it's right there. So we have the hydrogen here. We have the carboxylic acid group way over here. So we have a COOH, COOH. There's a amino group right here. And then this unique group over here, this ring structure and the OH, that is the R group. So that's tyrosine. We see something similar for tryptophan, which has the exact same kind of basic structure of the amino acid. The only difference is this R group over here, which again is unique for every amino acid. So these amine hormones are basically a tyrosine or a tryptophan that has been modded in some way. Um, so for example, melatonin is an, is an example of this that a lot of people are interested in in terms of sleep regulation. I talk a little bit about the mechanism of this in the next lecture. Also things that end in in, I-N-E, remember I-N usually tells you it's a protein, I-N-E tells you it's an amine hormone. So this is epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, those are examples of amine hormones. So these are Kind of protein based they are water soluble they are hydrophilic so that means that they can uh, kind of travel in the um, extracellular fluid quite easily but when they reach the cell they cannot pass through that plasma membrane so they have to bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell and then have effects inside the cell the peptide and protein derived hormones are a little bit more complex. These are things like insulin, oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone. And when you see that insulin and oxytocin, you see the IN. So again, that tells you that it is protein. Um, so when you're thinking about peptides, remember that amino acids have peptide bonds between them. They make that polypeptide chain. So a peptide hormone is a short chain of linked amino acids. They're basically small proteins, whereas a protein hormone is a much bigger, longer chain of linked amino acids. It's a full protein. So that's what we're seeing with insulin, oxytocin, and diuretic hormone. These are much bigger. So these are generally stored in vesicles um, so that they're able to cross the plasma membrane when they're produced inside the cell. Um, they are water soluble, they're hydrophilic. So again, they have to connect to those extracellular receptors. So when we're thinking about this binding to intracellular and extracellular receptors, remember that that fundamentally comes down to the chemical properties of these different molecules. If something is hydrophobic, it does not play well with water, but it does cross that plasma membrane quite easily. So these are things like steroid hormones, which can bind to receptors in the cytosol or the nucleus. So they pass through that plasma membrane, they reach the cytosol, they reach the nucleus, um, and then they form this complex right here. <laughs> So this receptor hormone complex that is going to bind directly to the DNA. 
So um, DNA is kind of trippy. It codes for proteins, which can then kind of sit back on top of the DNA. Um, RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase kind of read that DNA. And if you have something stuck on top of it, that regulates this process of transcription. Um, so uh, when we're talking about transcriptional regulation, this is what we're talking about. Um, I'll get back to that in just a moment, this idea of binding directly to DNA. Thyroid hormones don't even have to form this complex ahead of time. We'll talk about those in the next lecture, but they bind directly to receptors on the DNA or different sites on the DNA. So both of these act to regulate transcription. Remember that DNA codes for RNA, specifically messenger RNA, through a process called transcription. RNA then acts as a code for protein through a process called translation. So if you are regulating this process of DNA coding for RNA, you are regulating transcription. And you do that by binding directly to the DNA and preventing it from being read or allowing it to be read to um, code for messenger RNA. So that's often that idea of transcriptional regulation often has to do with these hydrophobic hormones because they can reach the DNA and interact with it. Remember that when we saw this image earlier, there was that signal perception um, with a ligand and a receptor outside of the cell, and then this intracellular continuation of the signal. We have a series of arrows right there. The fact that there is a series of arrows there is actually really important when we're thinking about second messengers and hydrophilic hormones. So those hydrophilic hormones have to bind to extracellular receptors because they cannot cross the plasma membrane. So they start these signal cascades, these signal transductions, using these types of molecules called second messengers. The hormone itself is the first messenger. They send a signal to the second messenger. So kind of like a game of telephone, um, they're kind of sending that signal onward. So some classical examples of second messengers are CAMP or cyclic AMP and IP3. We'll talk about each of those pathways individually. So cyclic AMP, as the name suggests, is has a ring structure in it. It's cyclic and it's a derivative of ATP. Remember that ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine is referring to the, um, the kind of ring structure, the, that sugar structure, as well as the nitrogenous base that's on the right side of the structure of ATP. And there's the three phosphate groups that are being highlighted in the red box on that left image. Um, and so that's adenosine triphosphate. There's three phosphate groups. If you knock off one of those phosphates, you get adenosine diphosphate and a phosphate group, knock off another one, and you get adenosine monophosphate. So you derive adenosine monophosphate from ATP, and then you go through um, dehydration synthesis. Yeah, to, um, to kind of bring that ring structure together um, and make that cyclic AMP. So it's basically adenosine monophosphate, except you've kind of brought a couple of those ends together. You've joined that phosphate group back to that, um, to that circular uh, sugar group and made a cycle. So that's the structure of cyclic AMP. So to kind of walk you through what happens with cyclic AMP, the first step of all of this is that a hydrophilic ligand binding to a receptor on the outside of the cell. So these receptors have something called a G protein. There's lots of different types of G proteins. It's a class of proteins, but it's basically kind of sitting on the other side of that receptor from where the ligand is binding. So that G protein gets switched on by the ligand binding to the receptor. Um, so again, it's a series of switches. Switching on that G protein then activates something called adenylate cyclase or adenylyl cyclase. Um, so adenylyl cyclase. It's a um, enzyme that is embedded in the membrane and kind of um, does something. So the functional role of that is to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. Um, so it's having to do with adenosine triphosphate, adenylyl. It's a cyclase. So it, its job, it's an enzyme. Its job is to make something cyclical. It converts that ATP to cyclic AMP. So ligand binds, switches on G protein, G protein switches on an enzyme, enzyme makes a bunch of cyclic AMP. So the ligand again was that 
first um, messenger, the cyclic AMP is the second messenger. So then that cyclic AMP travels, it sends a message somewhere else, and that message is to activate protein kinase A or PKA. So that protein kinase A is involved in something called a phosphorylation cascade. That is the cellular response that is happening, and adding phosphates or removing phosphates from different molecules is what ultimately results in a cellular response. So to explain that part of it a little bit further, when you phosphorylate something, you if it's a protein, you turn on the protein. Um, remember that enzymes are types of proteins that catalyze reactions. And again, we're using ATP and the fact that you can break off those phosphate groups in order to have a cellular response. So a kinase acts to break apart that ATP. It releases a phosphate group. That phosphate group binds to a protein. And then when you have phosphatase coming in, that enzyme acts opposite to kinase. So its job is to come in, pop off that phosphate group, um, and then you have a dephosphorylated or inactive protein. So this seems kind of simple overall, but there are so many different types of target cells with their unique cell structure. There's different types of G proteins. There's different kinases and phosphorylated proteins. So even though this is kind of like a basic overview, there's many different effects that can happen. Cyclic AMP is regulated by an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. Um, and so that is responsible for basically ending the signal and making sure that cyclic AMP doesn't have a continuous effect. You want there to be some effect, but you don't want it to go on forever. This is how those negative feedback loops that homeostasis is maintained. So we have the structure of cyclic AMP on the left. Phosphodiesterase or PDE is going to act on it. Um, and then you have this uh, bond between the phosphate and that circular sugar, that cyclical sugar being broken. So you're breaking apart that cyclical part of the AMP. You end up with AMP and water. Um, so you have that kind of opening up of that um, phosphate group and the sugar, and you're back with AMP. So you don't have any more cyclic AMP to send that signal. So that was the cyclic AMP second messenger pathway. There's also inositol triphosphate or IP3 and diacylglycerol or DAG or DAG. So this starts out the exact same way. You're gonna have a signal binding to a receptor. That signal is hydrophilic, so it's binding externally. That's gonna switch on a G protein, which is then gonna switch on something else. So when that G protein is activated, it activates something called phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is again embedded in the membrane on the inner part of the cell. Um, it's an enzyme, it's a, a enzyme ASE, and its job is to break apart a phospholipid. So it splits phospholipid PIP2, which is kind of uh, in the membrane, kind of adhered near the phospholipase. It splits it apart um, and then forms uh, inositol triphosphate or IP3 as well as DAG, diacylglycerol. So when you have this phospholipase being switched on, you get these second messengers, these IP3 and DAG. Um, those are then going to cause other downstream effects. DAG is going to activate a protein kinase. You get that classical phosphorylation cascade. And you also have some regulation built in with IP3. So IP3 is responsible for releasing calcium ion. Um, that's gonna be super important when we talk about the nervous system. That also directly affects enzymatic activity or it regulates the action of the protein kinase. So that IP3 is kind of uh, regulatory, whereas the DAG is really just starting that phosphorylation cascade. So you should know that IP3 and DAGs are another example of those um, second messengers that are associated with the function of hydrophilic hormones. So up until this point, we've been kind of thinking about a one-to-one -one relationship with hormones and receptors, but it would not be very efficient if you only had a single receptor on a cell. Remember that cells um, and life in general is just so messy and it just depends on stuff bumping into each other. That's the basis of diffusion and osmosis. And when you think about hormones diffusing through your bloodstream, they have to be able to bump into a receptor. And that is not a very carefully controlled process. Um, 
So we don't just have a single receptor on the outside of the cell. It is regulated, either upregulated or downregulated, um, which then helps determine how sensitive the cell actually is to the presence of a hormone. If there are a lot more of those receptors, it's going to be more sensitive to the hormone. If there's less receptors, it's not as sensitive to the hormone. And that's what causes, um, that is what then allows there to be a cellular response. So in puberty, you have different levels of sensitivity to different hormones. That's how different cycles get established. So when we're thinking about this idea of upregulation, as the name suggests, that's increasing or moving up the number of receptors that in turn increases the cell sensitivity to the hormone. So you end up with more activity. With downregulation, that decreases the number of receptors and uh, also decreases cell sensitivity, so activity is decreased. So your plasma membrane is, again, so messy. It's a fluid mosaic model. There's all kinds of stuff moving in it. Um, in the kind of uh, excretion system and urinary system, we'll talk about um, these cells in your uh, in your nephrons and collecting ducts basically popping in aquaporins, popping in these channels. So your cell has a lot of kind of stuff on deck. It has stuff that it's just kind of saving and it can pop it and plug it into the receptor or into the um, plasma membrane when it's ready to. So these receptors are an example of that. If uh, instead of producing even more hormone, you can just pop in those receptors, instead of producing less hormone or trying to control the amount of hormone that's already been flooded into your body, you can downregulate those numbers of receptors and make yourself less sensitive. Um, and I'm saying like, I'm saying this like you can actually control it. Remember that this is kind of just like based on chemical signals, based on cell response. Um, you can't just like control your number of receptors. You already know that. I just wanted to clarify. Okay, so when we're thinking about the way different hormones interact with one another, we have one type called the permissive effect. As the name suggests, this is about giving permission. The first hormone has to be there in order to allow another hormone to act. That first hormone has to give permission. And we see this with different thyroid hormones that we'll talk about in the next lecture. There's also a synergistic effect. A synergism is a kind of positive interaction is when you're like vibing with someone and you know ha uh, being able to accomplish stuff together so when you have two hormones that have the same effect they produce a amplified response they are synergistic so we see this a lot with sex hormones um, we'll talk about it in terms of like gonadotropin releasing hormone and LH and FSH and um, kind of like that process. There's also, for example, androgens that are secreted by gonadal tissue as well as adrenal tissue. So you have synergism between those different androgens. And so kind of the contrast to synergistic is antagonistic effects. If something is antagonistic, it's like going against you. So these two hormones have opposite effects. Um, the kind of classical example of this is the action of insulin and glucagon. We'll unpack this slide a little bit more in the next lecture. So when we're thinking about different mechanisms that have the ability to increase production of hormones um, or, or kind of regulate the production of hormones and also the secretion of hormones, we're thinking about three specific mechanisms. The first is humoral. This is basically looking at the fluids. Remember that humors are kind of like a old timey word for fluids. So when you have humoral changes, these are changes in the extracellular fluids, like changes in ion concentration in the blood. Um, those are going to cause changes to the uh, synthesis and secretion of hormones. There can also be hormonal regulation where um, the secretion and uh, synthesis is changed in response to the feedback from another hormone. Um, and then there's also neural. So if you think about something like fight or flight, when you have uh, so like something scares you all of a sudden, you have your sympathetic nervous system acting um, and you have epinephrine and norepinephrine, this is kind of more of a fast response. So this is this like overlap between um, neural signaling and endocrine signaling. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Um, I'm gonna post the 
I'm going to take a quick break, post some stuff to Canvas, and then uh, record the next endocrine lecture, so it should be posted soon. Um, make sure that if you haven't gotten a chance to read that announcement, that giant announcement I posted to Canvas, explaining how we're going to continue with the course, please read it. You get extra credit just for reading it, and it is so important for you to know how we're going to figure out how to do this. Um, there is a reflection and a quiz posted, so please make sure you do those. Um, you'll have kind of passed the, uh, the exam on Monday. Well, okay, so just to kind of explain, let me backtrack. The exam will be available online Monday through Wednesday. You will have until Monday at midnight to complete the reflection and the quiz. So you could technically um, take the exam before you take the quiz. I do not recommend that you do that. Those quiz questions are going to be on the exam. So it is so important for you to get that done. Um, if you do your reflection uh, after you take the exam, just make sure that you get the exam done before Monday at midnight because that's when your reflection is done. Um, I know sometimes it's easier to just wait until you've already done the exam. If you turn your reflection in late, you can turn it in up to 48 hours late for partial credit. Also, um, while we're at it, keep preparing for lecture exam too um, and make sure that, uh, yes, I did post something clarify or did I post it for your class? I'll make sure that something's posted for your class. Um, to, because so, so many of my classes have exams and I have two physio sections and I know I told some of you, but maybe not others. Uh, I know I'm pretty sure I told all of you. Okay, the exam is definitely gonna be online. So campus is fully shut down, at least through April 27th. At that time, we're going to reassess the situation. Um, so exam two will for sure be online. Exam three might have to be online too. We'll just kind of play it by ear. So thank you again for all of your patience.